our discussion today will be about how produced water is being managed and the impact it will have on the market. I'm your host for today's SBE Live, David Gibson. So thankful and happy that you guys are all here with us and watching today. So please do what we always do on the live streams. Interact with us. Let us know where you're watching from. We'll give you guys a shout out here on the screen momentarily. Uh, as well, as we go through today's discussion, please be sure to ask your questions, give us your feedback. And speaking of which, we're also going to be able to get your perspective on today's topics. One great way to interact with us on today's uh, broadcast is to share your voice in the audience questions, All right? We will ask you several questions throughout the broadcast and you just answer in the comments, all right? Audience question number one uh, is now open. How much has the produced, produced, produced to fresh water ratio increased the last two years? Obviously in the last two minutes, I've forgotten how to read. So, but <laughs> give us your answer there in the comment section now. All right, let's get this going in. Let's get this thing going. All right, this today's speaker, and today, or today's guest, we have Kobe Reynolds, Director of Water Treatment at the Tetra Technologies. Kobe has worked as an operations engineer and consultant in the Permian Basin and holds a degree in chemical engineering. Oh, Kobe, and welcome to this SBE Tech Talk. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Well, I'm glad you're here and be able to answer the questions because today I just can't read. All right. I saw on your LinkedIn that you, you that you recycled more than 1 billion gallons of water last year. Correct. I mean, volumes just keep increasing and we'll just keep uh, taking them as they come. So hopefully improve on that number next year. Or this That's a very, very even number right there at 1 billion. Well, you know, that was a little bit of, yeah. <laughs> 1 billion looks better than... 1.2 billion, you know, 1.1 1. 1 billion, 700,620. Can't remember the exact number, but 1 billion sounds really nice, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> operators, I, and so operators are looking for combinations of sustainability and effectiveness. I'm eager to hear more about uh, your expertise in this and how a company can be strategic with their water usage. Absolutely. Um, so <clears throat> Tetra, you know, in the last year or two, we've uh, we've acknowledged the growth potential in the produced water midstream markets. Um, this uh, this initiative has really been uh, to increase our uh, our technology in the water recycle sector. Um, we see volumes increasing continuously, uh, given the recent restrictions handed down by the Railroad Commission. Uh, beginning of last year, beginning of, uh, beginning of this year, uh, uh, we just see volumes increasing more and more. So uh, we invested capital in more equipment for processing produced water volumes, uh, equipment which can reach our customers, key performance indicators efficiently and effectively. Um, and so, uh, you know, you're privy to the market just as much as anybody else in, in the oil and gas industry. Uh, I think that was a recent uh, partnership uh, announcement between Aris and Chevron. Uh, we see a lot of those coming down as far as the sharing of the water uh, coming off of the wellhead. Uh, the midstream companies obviously want to commit capital to their midstream uh, development, buying surface, purchasing infrastructure, and the EMPs want to obviously give capital to their exploration and production programs. Um, and I kind of see Tetra Swift Water, you know, our competitors, we fit in as that uh, puzzle piece connecting the two um, where they don't want to spend their capital on things like water recycle tech, the know-how, the chemistry, the staffing required to do the testing, the analysis. Uh, uh, Tetra can fill in that gap because that's what we specialize in, uh, water treatment on the fly and water recycle. Um, the midstream divisions themselves, uh, you know, they, they obviously have uh, a source for this industry. They, they hold the keys as far as the amount of water that they generate per day. Um, but each customer is going to have customer. I mean, a, a producer may have different KPIs. Um, also, they may not be able to service that particular producer in all areas. You know, a midstream companies in one area, they might not necessarily have a foothold in another area. So 
uh, Tetra can pick up our process from one midstream division, cleaning water for X midstream for a producer, carry it over to another field in the other part of Texas or New Mexico and replicate the same process meeting the same KPIs. So that gives us uh, an advantage in regard to, you know, our specific treatment and how we tailor each treatment to each client. Um, we see a lot of these deals coming down between uh, producers and the midstream divisions. And we're involved in several of those discussions because it's, it's really on us to make sure that the, the customer's KPIs fit their completions programs. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll just see as the market develops where this all is going to lead to as far as who will control the water and who's going to control all of the assets as far as water recycle infrastructure. And so what are the options out there that you would recommend with that? It seems that on the fly treatments have evolved in recent years. Absolutely. Um, just like anything else in the market, the more it's used, the more it's exploited, the better it becomes, the more efficient it becomes. Uh, now, there is sort of a metaphorical wall uh, in supply chain. That's what I've been privy to mostly as things pick up as they've done in the past few weeks, uh, you start to come to those walls where, you know, X uh, suppliers running low on the raw materials to create some of the tanks you need to do your processing. So we have to be malleable. We have to fluctuate with what the market demands and then uh, kind of relay that information to our client base. Um, I always tell guys when I'm <clears throat> speaking to them about uh you know their expectations on kpis volumes um if you want to reach a certain percentage of uh recycled volume for your frack job uh, you know we'll need certain things certain capital costs to uh, implement the kind of infrastructure they need to reach those goals and with that comes added cost um, and then the conversation might go into well what other optionality do we have um, that's one of the great things about tetra is um, we have a great base of uh, science technology here so we can adjust on the fly according to meeting market demands um, we want to pursue new avenues for uh, i guess reducing cost on recycle to make it more attractive i personally see uh, recycle taking the place entirely of uh, saltwater disposal capacities i don't see them as effective means of uh, managing water at all. Um, and given the recent uh, Rebel Commission uh, deep well disposal restrictions, uh, I think that's the first marker, sort of the the push off of the metaphorical cliff for these EMPs to realize, you know, this isn't just an ESG feather in your hat. This is something that's going to be necessary for the development of future oil and gas wells. Um, just, uh, it, and, and it's a win-win really for them. It's, it's a, I think it's a cheaper means of uh, managing water, and I believe it's more effective means. And I think it's a, uh, it I think it actually helps in a lot of cases their uh, drilling completions program just due to to the compatibility with the formation that you get from produced water versus a freshwater frag. Um, but as far as evolving our technology around the demands, I mean, it it's really you know pick and choose who's doing what. Um, a lot of that centered around what's in the water, what we have to pull out of the water um, and what each completions package allots as far as uh, treatment uh, being more stringent versus more lax. So things from frack on the fly, allowing things to shock and drop all the way up to a DAF unit and then so on, even to an uh, RO system. It's really just whatever the client needs, we can provide it. Excellent. Well, before we go much further, we do have another audience question. So audience, uh, we'll put this one up here on the screen and you guys answer in the comment section. In the last two years, how much of an increase have you seen in recycling volumes in lieu of disposal? So be sure to put your uh, answer there into the comment section. We'll probably reference those here in a second. Kobe, I'm, I'm curious what your experience has been on this topic. How is Tetra involved in the water recycling process? Oh, um, just pretty much from beginning to end. Uh, I like to describe Tetra as the uh, cure-all, uh, one-stop shop for uh, water in oil and gas. We can move it, we can clean it, uh, we can 
clean it on the fly to frack. Um, we can flow it back. Uh, we can store it, uh, aerate it, keep it healthy. Um, basically, any and all facets of uh, produced water management, Tetra can handle it. Um, our involvement recently has been, you know, looking at the future development of the market, being that go between um, making those deals between producer and midstream company. We want to we want to we want to encourage the use of produced water, not just for the ESG purpose, but because it's it is the future of water recycle. Um, so bringing technology that we know works, proven technology, uh, you know, a lot of companies have their own proprietary uh, technology and, you know, Tetris certainly subject to that as well. We have in-house tech that we are really proud of. Obviously the Tetris steel, our blending manifolds, our, uh, our flowback technology, it's, it's great, but we also uh, have a very pragmatic approach as far as uh, utilizing what's going to be most effective. So we're, we won't shy away from outside technology, bringing it into our, uh, our uh, I guess our, our uh, tool belt to uh, be more effective on each treatment. Um, and whatever, whatever that means, it's just uh, what works best. Uh, some call it the KISS method. You know, I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> but no, it's it's just the the full on blueprint uh, from beginning event to end using our technology. All right. So another hot topic uh, here for you. Um, it's been a bit of a, a game changer here. Seismicity. How is seismicity evolving the recycling landscape? Well, in my mind, it was sort of the. The, I guess the primary shoot, if you want to follow the metaphor uh, for parachute, you know, there's the backup, obviously, but this was the first indicator to some of the uh, production companies out there that the consequences of D well disposals uh, actually had some uh, real impacts on how they approach development of a new field. Uh, further development of old fields uh, and how to manage their water. Uh, there's certainly a, a, a ton of the larger producers that were already aware just due to the fact that they have tremendous volumes. That's where they had an advantage was because of the uh, number of wells that they operate per day. They operate a, you know, a thousand wells a day somewhere in, in the Permian basin. That's hundreds of thousands of gallons of water, millions of gallons of water that they have to figure out, okay, what am I going to do with this today? Um, so to address that, they invested more time and resources into understanding uh, <clears throat> adjacent practices that could help them produce water management. Well, some of the smaller groups, maybe even some the mid-sized groups, you know, they assumed that disposal well would be a great out um, and they didn't allocate as many resources to address the produced water issue the metaphorical wave we've been talking about for the past few years. Well, we're kind of at that cresting point. And I think the the push away from deep well disposals was like I talked about the that first shoot to, hey, guys, you better figure this thing out. Um, and that's where we come in. Uh, we had a few calls on the front end of that when it was coming down the pipeline. Um, guys, uh, you know, we've got this new field that we're developing. Uh, what's the solution here? And we helped them out, uh, got them into a, a loose produced water recycle uh, facility, a couple of different individuals and kind of got their, their completions program picked up, picked up again in certain areas. But um, it, it caught a lot of people by surprise. And I think that we'll see in the future more and more development to the water recycle in lieu of SWD because of all these restrictions. So the future is going to be sharing water, sharing technology, and maybe a baseline understanding of what KPI should be across the board. But we'll see. All right. Once again, we have another audience question. Uh, this one's really interesting to see what our listeners have to say. Listeners being y'all. Okay. What do you see as the most likely alternate to salt water disposal? A, increase the number of recycle facilities, B, surface discharge, or C, evaporation. Also, if y'all have any questions, please be sure to put them in the comment section now. We'll start to be able to go through those right after this next question. All right, Kobe, while the audience is answering that, the, uh, their poll question, let's talk about what the future looks like. 
How will recycling facilities compete with the CapEx of developing disposal wells? To me, it's a it's a simple answer. Uh, recycle has so many advantages over uh, disposal well construction. I mean, they both require obviously some CapEx, um, maybe comparable. I, I, I haven't looked at uh, the capital it takes to drill and complete a, a SWD in some time. I'm sure it's gone up just like anything else in the market right now. But um, it all goes back to uh, recycle. Um, SWDs can be picked up and moved. SWDs have restrictions as far as how many barrels you can put down them. So you're already capped at how effective you can be. Um, and this is no news to anybody. Um, but recycles, obviously, they're recyclable, funny enough. Uh, you can pick it up and move it wherever you need it. Um, volumes come down in one area. You can reduce the capacity of a water recycle, allocate resources to another part of the field. You're developing another part of the field and um, maybe you're not starting a, a DNC program for the next year and a half, but you've got plenty of water over there. Well, your neighbor, uh, you know, other operator X, you know, your operator Y, hey, I need volumes. Uh, do you have those volumes? Yes. Um, well, I don't have anybody to clean it. Well, let's call Tetra, uh, get them to start recycling water for your drilling completions program in the meantime. And then you'll be pulling in capital uh, or revenue off of those water sales, further uh, ensuring capital for your drilling completions program. And then when time comes for the turnaround on yours, you'll uh, you'll be very well positioned for water and you may not even need volumes uh, once you start your program. I think that the, the sharing of water is advantageous uh, across the board. Um, it's a much better use of surface. Um, it's a much better uh, use of capital. Um, and at the end of the day, you're you're reducing the overall uh, impact you have on the environment around you uh, just because you're not introducing more volumes, i.e. fresh water, into an already packed uh, formation, uh, further, you know, you know, demonizing, I guess, the already poor reputation that frac has in uh, our world now. So I think that it's, it's a very necessary step. Excellent. All right, so we do have a couple of uh, uh, questions here from the audience. Uh, first one up is from Thomas Smith. Kobe, what are the major elements that are targeted for cleanup of frac water for reuse and versus disposal downhole? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it, it changes from one uh, client to the next. Um, like I said earlier in the discussion, uh, each client has a has a different KPI, but your primary general uh, contaminants you want to focus on are your uh, oil and grease content, your iron content, and your turbidity. Um, so we're looking for you know iron under five usually, uh, which will eliminate using an oxidizer or coagulant flocculation process. Um, other guys, you know, that they have water chemistries that are a little, little bit more friendly to play with. So you can get away with something as easy as hydrogen peroxide, shock and drop, allowing things to precipitate in the bottom of a pond. And then, of course, the oil and grease will uh, flow to the surface, uh, peroxide being a great breaker. Um, but basically, uh, we see most KPIs falling in that under five iron in solution um, and under 20 turbidity. Um, there are some ORP pH uh, requests, but luckily the, the kind of manipulation that we do to water does not uh, pull those uh, those out of uh, what's not an ideal scenario as far as constraints. So typically in the 300 millivolts and between six and eight on the pH to refrain from FR uh, damage on uh, the frac pad. Hopefully that All right. <laughs> I can't say yes or no if it did or not. So uh, if, if we have any follow-up there from him, if, uh, I believe it was Thomas. If you have any follow-up to that, uh, please put it in the comment section. We'll keep going on. Uh, so next one is from uh, Bob or Babak, but he goes by Bob, it looks like, and he's got a PhD, so he's a doctor. Okay, can you give us an estimation of BWPD? And I have no idea what that stands for, so... Please, at least enlighten me so I know what that that acronym is. I haven't seen that one before. 
I, I think that's barrels of water produced daily. Um, so each facility is different. And, uh, you know, you see anywhere from 20,000 barrels a day and uh, up to, you know, 200,000 barrels of water per day. Um, it all depends on the size of the recycle. And like I said, the KPIs, uh, we love large facilities, but they are uh, usually relegated to areas where there's going to be a, a, an uptick in production for a particular client. Say they have a, a you know, 130 well production plan uh, in the next two years. Uh, they'll give us a call. Hey, can you set up a 120, 200,000 barrel per day facility? It's always yes. But um, in other cases, uh, I have uh, individuals reach out to me and say, hey, I've got this reserve pit of water that I, I, I don't want to haul off uh, from the pad at an expense of about $2 and 50 cents a barrel. Um, we have solutions for those as well, doing as low as 10 to 12,000 barrels per day uh, at a lower rate than what a vac truck can haul off uh, to a disposal well. So it, it, it varies a lot according to what the client needs. Uh, so big and small to answer your question. Excellent. Well, Bob, hopefully that answered your question. Okay, question for me here. How are we going to address the wave of water due to the restrictions on deep aquifer disposal? Just further development in the water recycle realm. Uh, we want to see more and more activity. Uh, we want to tell uh, the, our manufacturers of water recycle technology, you know, uh, bring up those uh, supply chains because we're going to have a, a bigger demand for larger equipment with greater capacity, better efficiency, better automation. Um, automation being a key player in that uh, deterrence from deep well disposals and SWDs overall. Because not only do we have to make this more effective, we also have to make it safer. I mean, how much safer does it get than an SWD that's basically hands off? You turn on a, a pump and shoots it down hole. Um, does all the work for you. We want to get there as well with the water recycle. And we're we're investing a lot of time and energy into the automation process. I mean, I have facilities that can do 100,000 100, barrels per day uh, with one operator. So we're, we're basically five times the capacity um, with one operator than you would get out of one SWD well. Um, and that should get better and better as time goes on, you know, telling you hopefully next year I can do 300,000 barrels a day with one operator. But, uh, you know, there are some companies that are there. Uh, we just need to uh, work to achieve that level of automation in the oil and gas industry. Municipalities are already doing it. They do it every day. Um, and as was the progression of technology from offshore municipality into West Texas, Permian, Delaware Basin, it's going to happen again uh, with the efficiency as far as water recycle uh, on our end. So, Okay, so we got another question here from uh, Mohammed, and he asks, does Tetra utilize chemicals to remove grease and oil residue in produced water recycling? Mohammed, thank you for your question. Yep. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, absolutely. Um, obviously, the less chemical you have to use the better reduces your operating expenditures but uh, luckily you can get away with a, a great breaker uh, in the form of oxidizers that are pretty cheap and easily available uh, to break that interface if you're dealing with some sort of emulsion problem which typically when it's uh, on the latter end of uh, produced water water being received at a uh, saltwater disposal facility uh, where those let's say gun barrel two uh, three-phase separators um where they might not be as efficient as the operator hoped we do catch those volumes um, at our water recycle facilities uh, tetra employed a, a good amount of research into developing what we call the o-wrapped uh, tanks oil recovery after production tanks uh, specialized for recovering those volumes on the front end of a water recycle process so that okay when you recycle if you have oil and grease uh, in your stream, that'll uh, the grease will get captured with the flock, essentially making the cleanup of that oil extremely difficult because there is flocculant involved in that separation. Um, the O-wrap, which comes before the water recycle facility, will recover those volumes before the oil is quote unquote trashed so that they're recoverable. You can take it back to your SWD. You can redistribute it to your uh, production tanks, uh, you know, that's your uh, asset so it's just a 
a question of what you want to do with it. But we have technology here to uh, keep you from wasting what is right now a, a very uh, expensive uh, product as far as barrels of oil. <laughs> All right. So one last question here from the audience. Uh, this one comes in uh, from from Dr. Bob. Once again, have you have you used produced water for water flooding? Um, that's, that's a great question. I, I'm not really sure. Um, you know, once the produced water leaves, uh, Tetra's, uh, water recycle facility, it's up to the producer, what they do with it. And obviously, uh, a water flood is absolutely in the realm of the, how the, the producer is going to extract their hydrocarbons. So it's, it's likely that it has been used, uh, for water flooding to improve the production rate of, uh, some of the surrounding wells but uh to my knowledge i can't see why it wouldn't be i mean it's formation friendly reduces swelling and it's absolutely the best home for those recycled volumes in lieu of an swd so i would hope so but i, I can't really tell you uh confirm whether or not that's the case but great question yeah, maybe something we'll look into uh when we follow up with you next year when you do come on to be able to say y'all can do three hundred thousand barrels Per day at your uh, facilities. All right, uh, Kobe, what's the best way to be able to get in touch with you? I mean, um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, oh, there we go. Right there. Absolutely. Uh, pretty easy to reach out to me. If you have any questions, I'm always available. I'm always eager to answer questions. It keeps me sharp. Uh, so I appreciate all the questions today and, you know, keep firing them at me and I'll uh, answer them as they come through. Well, thank you so much for being on today's episode. Special thanks to Tetra Technologies uh, for allowing Kobe to be able to take a 30-minute break from his normal job to be able to come on and talk with me.